Hey folks, my name is Ravish and welcome back to another video in the series of DevOps interviews. Now, I have a profile with me today and in this profile, the person that I'm interviewing today is around 14 years of experience and the relevant experience in DevOps is around 5 years of experience and then on cloud, he is having around 1 year of experience only. Alright, so the interview that I have that I have taken today is divided into a few parts like part 1, part 2, part 3. So the part one would be concentrating mostly on the AWS services. So we're going to talk about the ECS. We're going to talk about S3, ASG, CloudFrom. So over around 20 minutes would be concentrated on AWS. And after that, we'll be uh, talking about 10 to 15 good minutes on around Ansible. And then in part three, we are talking about the DevOps lifecycle. And then part four about the branching strategies and the other parts. All right. We're going to talk about the Docker today as well. All right. So these are the things that our interview would be revolving around. And if you're new over here, I would like to request that please subscribe the channel because it really motivates me to create more content like this. So without further ado, let's get started. Okay. Uh, so I got that your total experience is around 14 years, right? Yeah. And uh, your relevant experience in DevOps? Uh, five years. Total, I think past five years I've been in DevOps field. Okay, okay, great. And uh, around five years in cloud or more than that? Uh, cloud primarily, though I was started uh, cloud journey, but I was not exposed to cloud more uh, earlier. But past one year I am exposed to cloud more from AWS point of view. But I was uh, I usually like I was in a big organization, kind of potential. Uh, you might have mm -hmm. heard about where the platform team was owning entire cloud uh, cloud access. So we were getting access to the Terraform templates, mm -hmm. and we used to spin up the infrastructure using templates. Uh, and even the Azure portal and all, we were not having any access. So we get only the VMs for virtual machines and building infrastructure. And I mean, once you get into a, a VM, whether it is on-prem or cloud, it's more, more or less same. So we, we we were in that kind of environment earlier. But in current position, past uh, six months and before 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 this, uh, before just a uh, few months back, uh, I'm more exposed towards cloud now. So yeah. okay, 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 fair enough. So I'll take at one year, right? Yep. So which cloud are you? Oh, more comfortable, like AWS, Azure, anything? AWS, uh, I've been working past, past six months. Before that, I used uh, Azure as well. Okay, okay. Uh, so what are all the services that you have worked in AWS? So, I mean, to start with, I started working with EC2, then S3 buckets and CloudFront for hosting static websites and DNS uh, for Rock Route 53 and Lambda uh, especially. Uh, I use Lambda and uh, I am more of that. We uh, I use more more of IAM policies, designing IAM policies and building it. Uh, I think uh, that's all primarily. Uh, I use EC2 uh, uh, by default, and yeah, Elastic IPs and Auto Scaling Group, uh, Kubernetes, CCR, yeah, EKS, CCR. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so you talked about uh, just this. Auto scaling, right? Yes. Can you tell me the difference between EC2 auto scaling and AWS auto scaling? Okay. Uh, basically, you mean EKS auto scaling or something? No, no, no. EKS. EC2, yeah. EC2, the instance, EC2 auto yeah. scaling and AWS okay. auto scaling. Both are two different things. Can you tell me the difference between both of them? Okay, uh, as far as I understand, uh, e, uh, AWS auto scaling is basically triggered from the launch templates that we configure EC2. E, e, uh, I mean, we create a launch temp, we create a template, we configure a template, mm -hmm. and we the auto scaling group that will be managed by a, uh, managed by AWS AWS environments. But EC2, I think, based on the CPU and based on the percentage of CPU for consumes, uh, I think EC2 auto scaling group works. That that's what I can see uh, the difference. Okay, so you were talking about launch template, right? Uh, yeah. So there is something known as launch template, and there is something known as launch configuration. What is the configuration. difference between both of them? Uh, well, in the launch configuration, uh, <laughs> one second. 
launch template is basically uh, if uh, I have a EC2 environment, uh, EC2, uh, EC2 server, then I can create a template with that and I can I can use that template uh, configured uh, server for my auto scaling uh, spin up uh, the, the, the new new environments. But configuration is basically the same thing. We, I create a AMI and I install whatever servers and I open security group. I, I, I configure all the security groups that will be open. The health checks and all I configure in launch configuration. Which 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 port is healthy, I mean which port is exposing and what is executing that to be opened for that launch configuration. I'll configure in that way. Okay. Okay. Um so let us consider a scenario. Okay. Um yeah. I want you to devise a solution for it. Uh I'm not looking for an exact solution, but I just want to see your approach. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh consider a situation you are you have an application. Okay. okay. Your application processes messages. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you are using EC2 instance for it. Now, okay. if I, and you, you can use queues for that, the SKS part. Okay. Yeah. You can use queues for that. Now, as a DevOps engineer, I have not given you any access to the production. Okay. So all you have okay. is the dev. Now I mm -hmm. want to you to create an ASG auto scaling group because right now okay. we have only like let's say one instance I want you to create an ASG and I want you to test it so first the first part of this uh, question is I want you to create an ASG what the what are the steps that you'll do the second part is mm -hmm. how will you test it okay okay Okay. Uh, okay. 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 So for testing part, what uh, here? What we need is uh, one is launch configuration, and uh, with the a or right AMI image and all these things. Uh, uh, we'll we'll and, talk. We'll talk about the creation part first, and then we'll talk about okay. the testing part. So let's concentrate on the creation part first. Okay. Yes, uh, first of all, yes, uh, uh, to create auto scaling group first, I, uh, I need uh, auto scale, like what is the minimum number of instance and maximum number of instances. And then launch configuration, like what is the AMI used and the, the port groups. Uh, I mean, this is the this, uh, this security group for uh, 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 the EC2 instances, which is lobby launch configuration. And the ports that I need to check for uh, for, for for the health check, and uh, uh, these things I will create and yeah, yeah and yeah these things I'll create and on top of it I'll create a load balancer uh, for uh, and I'll I'll create a target group for that. Okay. On, on, okay. on top of the group I'll create a load balancer which will aim for target group of these EC2 instances. Um, how are you creating this infrastructure manually or by using any, any Terraform. 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 Yeah. Okay. So you have worked on Terraform as well. You, you told yes. That. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. We'll, we'll circle back to that later. So uh, your okay. infrastructure is created. Now, how are yeah. you going to test it? Okay. Testing in the sense, uh, what is this functionality of this? Like, uh, maybe so okay. Okay. What I can do here, uh, let's say you, you mentioned SQS, uh, I, I'll put some message in SQS queue and, uh, so assume SQS and EC2 are configured. So, I mean, the, the auto scaling group is configured, uh, such a way that, uh, it will pull the messages from SQS, right? The, the queue. Yeah. Yeah. The consumer is, uh, like that written like that, but I, hmm. how will you push the messages? What would be your approach? Maybe I can use simple Lambda function to push uh, messages into SQS. I can write uh, maybe simple Python code or I can write some, yeah, Python will be very easier to write a Python uh, code to push a message to SQS uh, as a producer. Okay. And how would be the flow of this? What will happen first? What will happen at the last? Okay. Uh, maybe what I can try, uh, try to build solution here is uh, let's say, um, Maybe I, I, I'll, I'll try to go go in different ways. Like I'll put some object in my S3 bucket. I mean, assume this way I'm, I'm trying to build it. And uh, there is a S3 trigger that will trigger the Lambda function. 
let let's take this way like uh, whatever the object i push to s3 that name of the object has to flow through ec2 assume that way so as soon as i put as soon as the user puts uh, the the file into the s3 bucket s3 s3 trigger has to happen and it has to trigger the lambda function lambda function has to read the fi file name and it has to push msh to the ec2 uh, to the load balance endpoint to the load load balance endpoint uh, okay. so that it that travels to ec2 auto scaling group and it will be stored in the uh, database if it is connected so that consumers can consume, uh, you know pick it up for, for the later uses maybe that way we can we can try to build it that, that is one way of building but yeah we can based on the situation we can uh, update the design okay okay um so you must have heard about the publisher con consumer model right yes okay so what is a publisher in this scenario and what is a consumer in this scenario so this is a pub sub basically uh, a publisher will be the model or the program that will push the message into the system and mm -hmm. consumer that will be uh, i mean it is by name itself uh, the, the the program which consumes the message and process it so here there are two uh, i mean uh, from ec2 uh, i mean if i if i talk about kafka cluster point of view i mean kafka terminology mm -hmm. so program which pushes the message to kafka cluster is a producer and there are some consumer groups or con a consumer which consumes the data let's say uh, let, let's take a mongodb which is sync connector or some some notification system that i need to build right which will pull the messages from the kafka cluster and it will send the notifications so that will be a consumer it's like it's like based on the name naming conventions okay okay uh, so you talked about cloud front as well right yeah uh can you define like what exactly is cloud front and why should i need it okay uh, i think cloud uh, i used for uh, static hosting uh, not uh, highly used but i used for once cloud front uh, my use case was like dns cache uh, so it's like a, it's like it's like uh, it's like a ca cache server like for example uh, for example I, I i hosted a website and i wanted to be available at all edge locations Uh, so instead of you know it's like edge location caching instead of uh, keeping one server at one location and let all the world will access the same server uh, cloudfront will be act like a cache uh, at all edge locations and if a user is near to one one region then it will uh, the user will get access i mean the user will get the data pulled from cloud near nearby edge location and it will it will hit the server then some cache will be stored at edge location and it will send back to the user again from different uh, location so here the cloud front play major role in terms of uh, caching so that level uh, like maybe you can say like uh, how and the thing same thing is like uh, there are multiple ways of uh, doing it like origin request and response how to manipulate and how to uh, how to how to the how to capture the headers for the head request before sending to the before sending to the actual server web server so cloud front will act like a friend friend gate uh, like or like a uh, uh, you know gate before hitting the uh, traffic to the server okay so you were hosting the any website on that static website on this uh, cloud front uh, static website uh, is on s3 bucket and cloud front acts like a cache uh, for on, on top of s3 so same same website right or something same else website. same website same. so the cache yeah. part was on cloud front Yes. So, like, when should I choose S three and when should I choose CloudFront? S three, uh, okay. Another advantage uh, with CloudFront is I can attach ACM uh, the HTTPS certificate. With S three, I I don't have option. Uh, another another advantage is I think uh, S three is basically a kind of uh, uh, a raw way of using hosting the website, but usually. Usually, the, if if we add a cloud front, then you can add, attach a ACM certificate, and I mean, which is a HTTPS certificate, and uh, you you can maintain this edge location caching. All these things will add an advantage. But yeah, from the hosting point of view, uh, it's more or less same. Like uh, you know, from the application, if uh, end user point of view, it will be more or less same. If it is hosting at S3 or hosting, I mean, putting cloud front on top of S3, uh, maybe we can put that same URL uh, in the DNS or 53, and they. I mean, users will access through the DNS name itself. 
but to add more add, uh, more control uh, on the server like uh, HTTPS access and edge location uh, cache, then we will go for cloud cloud front. Okay, okay. So who takes care of this? Uh, I am you or someone else? Uh, currently, there was one person who was there in DevOps team along with me, but uh, he I just joined six months ago here and okay. he left after I joined two months. So he even he also was new. Uh, so currently only one me, uh, I'm taking care of IAM. Okay. Uh, what's the difference between IAM policy and IAM rule? Okay. Uh, rule is basically, okay, let me talk about policy. Policy is basically what kind of uh, permissions that we need, uh, we need to give on a resource for a specific uh, uh, specific object or APIs. Let's take S3, uh, S3 bucket, or some S3 policy, right? So, uh, 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 okay. Yeah, uh, same thing. Like, well, in the sense, like, uh, I'll, I'll create a, a policy where for this bucket, I will only grant permissions on getting object and putting objects. I will not give any delete object permissions. So that I will put it in a JSON template, uh, JSON file, and I, I call that as a, this is a policy for this bucket. And when, I, when it comes to rule, uh, it's basically, it's a kind of, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a role is basically a kind of a resource, uh, which is, which is like, a, a, a user basically it's kind of user but role can be assumed by any other services that's the only difference between uh, uh, your role uh, for that this policy i can attach to a role so that whoever assumes the role they can up, they, they can have this policy uh, granted so they can use the same for all these things instead of attaching the policy right away to the user i can attach to a role so as a user i will assume the role and i'll do whatever the activities that i de described in the policy okay okay um yeah so what exactly you were doing in uh, aws lambda okay i used only one for one use case uh, mm -hmm. the, the basically uh, okay now the same use case like what i said uh, we have internal documentation site that i hosted uh, in, in static website s3 and cloudfront but uh, it is accessible to public so to avoid that, uh, to, 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 to limit the public access, uh, I need to stop the request right, from, from, from public, right? So what I did is I used Lambda. I, I used open source some plugin uh, to, for the Google, Google API authentication. So whoever has our internal Gmail account, we use Gmail for our office. Uh, whoever has the Google project account, they only get routed to, uh, uh, to the internal docs website. So I didn't find any uh, any solution to to control that limit access. Uh, so I, I created a Lambda function uh, and I added that to CloudFront as a viewer request. So whenever request comes, uh, it will first validate whether it is internal Gmail account or not, internal G Google account, and then it will write redirect to the uh, website. So that way I used the Lambda function. I, I would call that as Lambda Edge instead of Lambda. It's an, for it, for this caching, is a lambda edge is a specific purpose for that. Okay, so is vertical scaling possible in lambda? Okay, first of all, uh, vertical. I think I am not exactly sure. Uh, vertical scaling is basically uh, multiple instances, right? No. That's okay, in, uh, the CPU memory increment. Okay, that's uh, yeah. okay. I don't think so. Uh, as far as I understand. Okay, wait one sec. I think it should be possible. Uh, it, it will scale based on the number of resources and uh, CPU uh, usage. I think it will, it is possible. Yeah. Can you give me an example? If it is possible. Mm, I just give vague uh, example because I haven't worked on that part. Uh, but if I let's say, uh, so yeah, AP, let's say API gateway. Let's say you take this example as lambda. E well, well, it will pull the trigger and push it, uh, push it to AC to uh, auto scaling group. So maybe if uh, if the number of users are increased, who will put the bucket? I mean objects into the bucket. So the Lambda function it will auto scale and it will cater all the needs uh, of the triggering part. So maybe I can think of that as an example. Uh, it, it might auto scale, uh, auto scale and it will cater all the needs of users. Let's say otherwise 
until one request is done, then it has to wait for other requests. So the triggering mechanism might be uh, slow. I think serial. The other way, but maybe if you use L, because of the vertical scaling, it might go parallel. All the triggering will happen parallelly. That's what I can think. But I haven't worked on this uh, as of now. Okay. Okay. No problem. Um, so for configuration management, you folks were using Ansible. <laughs> Ansible. Yes. Okay. Uh, can you explain me the mechanism like what is pull pull in mechanism or is what is push mechanism uh, in terms of configuration management tools okay mm, i think it's a definition i can't remember but what i can say is this uh, there are two things one is uh, uh, yeah i remember uh, pull and push uh, okay let me recall Okay, I think, yeah, uh, this is like, uh, I mean, I, I can see the difference between pull and push from the way it operates, right? Ansible and uh, the uh, other tools like Chef and Puppet kind of tools. Mm -hmm. I think it's kind of iterative and imperative programming. One is, uh, I want this way. So I, Ansible, I will tell, uh, uh, this is the end state that we need to maintain so that it will ensure it will, it will maintain. But in uh, Chef and Puppet, I believe we need to declare what I need to, create to achieve my state so i think that's the difference that i can see uh, in, the, in the pull and push model i'm not sure it is correct but yeah uh, i think in, 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 in ansible we will say like for example ansible i want to install a program so i will say uh, apt I, i'll use apt keyword and jq and i'll put state as present so it doesn't matter whether i'm i'm saying or not i want this the file to be present so maybe if you can you blue, then I can can elaborate more. I, I remember, but I I, mean, I, I read it. I, I can't remember. Recall it exactly. Exactly. Okay. Um, I'll ask a few questions. I think then we'll circle back to this. Uh, yeah. So what exactly you are doing in Ansible right now in your project? Okay. So uh, we have a product called Fleet Tracker where we deploy uh, certain Docker Compose files and certain configurations, install some servers, uh, install, install some packages into target server. And apart from that, uh, we are, as I said, we are into AML space. So uh, we deploy some software and the Debian packages onto uh, the edge devices, which are mem which are number of dev AI OT devices. So to deploy it, uh, all this software, uh, we use Ansible. Like we 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 do configuration like. Once I get EC2 server, then I, I I trigger my Ansible playbook so that it will deploy uh, all the all the plays onto the onto the target server and to install a specific uh, certain software on all across the devices. Let's say hundred different devices. I trigger I, I put all the IP address in inventory and I trigger the Ansible playbook so that it will it will deploy the the all the packages on all all the devices simultaneously. So for for that we will use Ansible uh, for that. So you write playbooks for it or something? Yes, we use uh, roles. Uh, we use uh, playbook. Uh, we, we we actually write roles uh, uh, here. Uh, I mean, uh, we, we actually write roles for reusable components, and then the playbook will be called by. Uh, we'll reference the roles in the playbook. Okay. So when you write your uh, commands in your playbook, how do you run it? Okay, it's uh, this command called Ansible playbook. And uh, I will give inventory path, and I'll give the playbook path or name. Uh, then, uh, yeah, then then it will it will it, it will trigger the playbook. And in the playbook, I need to uh, write the host's config host, which is which target group or uh, host group that I'm targeting for. Uh, then it will it will it will aim it will trigger uh, the execution on all the devices under the group. So you might be having some uh, master node and few of them agents or a slave node, right? Yes. So where do you run this command in master or in, uh, in master, agency? Yes, in master. So you run this command in your master, right? Yes. So when you run this command in master, the same configuration gets uh, transferred to the agent, right? Correct. Yes. So then, can you tell me now what kind of mechanism it is, is this push or pull? Uh, it, it it is push. Yes. Yeah. So client pulls basically configuration from the server, so Ansible okay. supports the push mechanism. Yeah, and right, yeah. there are other tools, I guess. Chef, I guess Chef is uh, pull based. Pull, yeah, okay, I understand now. So each agent has to be installed in the servers. It will pull it and configure it. Um, okay. Yeah. 
So that was okay. one thing. Okay. Um, why do we use tags in in Ansible? Okay. Uh, tags is basically to aim certain tasks uh, while execution. Let's take, uh, I have three components. One is web application, one is key clock, key clock for authentication that we use, and one is Kafka. Uh, so each has different uh, tasks, different playbooks. So I, I will run all the all the tasks at, at a time, but if I want to focus only on web app, so I can just give tags and I can only run web app uh, tasks, uh, the, let, the task related to web app only, which are tagged with web, 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 web app. So I mean, it's basically, uh, to focus specific tasks to in the rerun or running. Okay. So there is a concept of ad hoc commands. Can you give an example yeah. for it? And why do we need it? Uh, ad hoc commands is basically one example that we definitely use uh, on the day one is the ping command. So it it's basically a quick way to check uh, the servers are reachable and our command is working fine or not. Maybe something like, uh, like let's say ping. Uh, so once, uh, I have inventory ready and I wanted to check all service, all the target servers are re, uh, reachable or not. I can just use adopt command and and I can target my host uh, inventory file and I can ping it. So if I get all the response, then yes. So instead of running peer playbook again, just use adopt simple adopt command to do some small specific tasks. Okay. Yeah. It acts as an alternative to yeah. writing, writing the stuff. So you folks use JSON or YAML? Uh, YAML. YAML. Why YAML? Not why not JSON? I think I'm not sure. Yeah, JSON can be used. Uh, I think until now. Uh, but yeah, uh, even previously also I've, I've been using YAML. I have not used JSON. Uh, yeah, I have not used J JSON early, uh, even now also. Uh, I'm not sure what is the reason, but yeah, we use YAML uh, for Ansible. Okay. Okay. No problem. Uh, heard about Kausi in Ansible? Kausi. C O W S A Y. No, I haven't heard, but uh, no, I haven't heard. No, yeah, I know. no, no, if, no I... if not heard, then it's okay. Okay, it's fine. Um, so let's say there is a playbook written, okay, and okay. there is a variable name given over. Mm -hmm. How do you access it? So, can you tell me the command or code? Any, yeah, uh, I, I need to put that variable in uh, uh variable in flavor brackets, mm -hmm. then I can use that in uh. I can I can use that in my Ansible playbooks or in the in the rules or tasks. Okay. 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 Yeah. Yeah. And if I have a nested uh, variables, let's say var dot something. So under that, then still I, I mean I just use the same concept, but I need to use nested logic var dot the variable name. Okay. Something. Yeah. Uh, have you heard about Ansible facts? Uh yes, Ansible facts. Yes. Why do we use them? These are Ansible facts. Uh, actually, one is uh, it's a variable, it's basically a pretty, uh, setting facts we call it as. Uh, so I wanted to reuse some. Let's say, uh, let's take a simple example. Like I wanted to install uh, uh, some Debian package uh, into a server. That first, be first before that, I need to capture what is whether it is Debian or focal distribution. So first I'll run a command, some etc, uh, some command, then I'll capture the Debian focal or then I put it in a fact. So it's a variable, it's a basically a placeholder for that value. At one time we can use it. And there are pre predefined uh, variables like uh, OS home path or uh, OS uh, Ansible, Ansible directory, all this. There are some predefined variables with, uh, with Ansible itself. That also we call it as Ansible facts, I believe. Okay. Have you ever used modules uh, in your in your Ansible setup? Uh, modules will uh, I think each task is using a module like APT is module, right? So in the in that context you are telling. Yeah, yeah. So you are using yeah. them, right? Shell APT, yeah. Yeah. So how many types of modules we have? By definition, I'm not sure uh, what. Uh, but if you ask me about types. Uh, one is Ansible built-in modules and uh, built-in modules that will be there. And one is custom built modules like Popo. I think we need to install some modules explicitly if you are using it. Let's say Docker, uh, Docker as a module. And yeah, that's 
but internal details, uh, I think I'm not in. in uh, I, I didn't go inside. Okay. Um, basically, there are two modules. Uh, one is mm -hmm. core, and other one is extra. So, heard okay. about it? What is core module? Any idea on that? Um, okay, I think it's a built-in modules that you were talking about. Uh, the core. What do you understand by built-in module over here? Uh, I, what I understand is it's basically uh, Ansible by uh, when you install Ansible itself, you will get modules. Okay, by so Bitcoin. can you uh, name one or two modules that you you folks are using? Uh, we use rsync, we use apt, we use shell, okay. we use docker. So for this apt module, did you install anything separately? No, it, it, it came by, yeah. Yeah, so that would be the core module. Core, okay, okay. So, uh, and the other one is maintained by this. Uh, we have a huge community for okay. Ansible, so these folks, I mean, they are oh, popular, yeah, okay. but are not a part of uh, okay, the okay, installer. Okay, yeah. okay. Anyway, so uh, how are you maintaining plugins in your Ansible? Uh, so far, we didn't get any any requirement to maintain plugins. Uh, um, maybe we are not using any plugins. Oh, okay. If you're not using, then it's fine. Yeah. So, uh, anything on inventory part, Ansible inventory, you are doing? Uh, yes, we we use inventories uh, for let's say for different clients. Uh, we have we for different variables I need to capture, so I create different folders for different clients, and then I'll keep all the inventory in that folder. Um, while while running playbook, I'll point to the specific inventory to trigger it. Um, do you know the types of inventories? I think this is the example for static inventory, and uh, because I fix everything and I put it, uh, there's one thing called dynamic inventory as well mm -hmm. uh, that I came across uh, especially uh, while deploying while running Cube Spray Ansible playbook. Uh, there is a dynamic inventory concept that I have come across, but I haven't used much here. Okay, so like. Just a guess, when should I use static and when should I use dynamic? Uh, static is basically when we know the the targets of our host, host names and all, uh, we can we can go for uh, static inventory. But dynamic actually in conjunction with Terraform, maybe Terraform or cloud and infrastructure that we spin up and we get the IP address the dynamically, then we, we, we need to use, maybe I just uh, we 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 need to use we need to build the inventory dynamically, right? So the the IP and all not static, not constants. So in that cases we can we can go for dynamic inventory building. Okay, okay. So there is very one very famous feature item potency in Ansible. Yeah. Uh, what does that yes. supposed to mean? Item potency is nothing but in general that by definition it nothing but uh, if you do same action multiple times the state will not change so item potency is nothing but like for example http request is there right so uh, let's say get so if it's a it's item potent which means if you do if you call the get multiple times the end state will not change so same similarly ansible is also item potent let's say apt install state uh, apt install the package and state present you run multiple times the it will not work if it is present it will exit otherwise it will install it okay Okay. Um, so you folks use Docker here as well or something else? Yes, yes. Uh, we are using Docker, yes. Okay. Uh, so what kind of application do you have worked on? Java based? C sharp based? Any? Uh, prior to this, I worked on Java. Uh, Java as well. And, but currently, these are, uh, I think, these are Python related and uh, some are C. Uh, C, no, not C. Uh, a React uh, JavaScript based uh, applications. Okay. So uh, I I think you must be aware about like when we write code in Java, we use some kind of compiler to compile it, some kind of uh, let's say Maven. We Maven, use Maven yeah. to build it, right? Yeah. And then we create a class file, we create jar or a ear file out of it, right? Yes. What happens in case of Python? Python. Uh... You can take an example of the pipeline that you folks use in your in your company. Okay. Okay. Mm. 
Python basically has a requirement.txt that we need to package it and install all the all the dependencies in the in the in, in the in the system. So if I go for Dockerizing a Python application, uh, I'll add the dependencies in the requirement.txt and I'll I'll do pip install all the dependencies inside the Docker container so that all the packages will be installed in the container. So maybe yeah, we use pip or a pip install or pip three or something based on the version. Okay, so uh, let's say tomorrow uh, there is a developer in your team who is writing his code into Python mm -hmm. and putting it into some kind of, let's say, GitHub. Okay. Yeah. Uh, where do you keep your code? SV in yeah. GitHub? Yeah. GitHub? GitHub, yeah. GitHub only. Great. So can you walk me through the pipeline from the step uh, one, like checking out code and then what do you do after that and till the production? Can you walk me through the number of steps and what do you do exactly over there? Okay, sure. So maybe uh, in this company currently it's not that much matured uh, program program yet because it's a startup and they started uh, educating or uh, building DevOps processes. Uh, but I can quote in my previous projects like what we, we used to do is basically as soon as the um, we were using Jenkins mm -hmm. uh, Bitbucket really uh, as soon as the user uh, I mean usually we we follow the release based branching strategy so it's like uh, the development lead will create a release branch and the developers will get created we have two week sprint model so so every, uh, each developer will get a feature branch from the release branch and he'll do the development and uh, the commits code into the feature branch as soon as the feature branch is uh, I mean, as soon as he commits the code uh, the, the pipeline gets triggered and it runs the unit test, it runs linter tests, integration tests. Uh, then it builds the package and deploys uh, the artifacts into Artifactory, which is JFrog we were using. Uh, so once, uh, I mean, it, it is like an internal activity. So then the, the package will be deployed. Using the pipeline, the package can be deployed onto the target environment, which is QA environment, and it can be tested against the functional test cases. And if its functional test cases are uh, successful, then it can be deployed to uh, it can be deployed to uh, the production ideally. So this is uh, a plain way. But in what we do here is the feature branches get merged to release branch, and uh, release branch gets deployed to the QA environment, and the release branch uh, will get tested with regression environment. Once it is tested, once it is tested successfully, then it merged to master. Then in master, we get a, we get a CI build, uh, the final build of based on the tag, and it finally pushes the final artifact into artifactory. Uh, since we, uh, e e there are two things. One is, uh, if you can, we were like on-prem kind of environment, not like Kubernetes environment uh, earlier in the old, old company. So, and I was, in, I was in financial institution as well. So what will happen is there's a dedicated team called PSS. They 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 verify, they create a ticket in service now, and they, they it will get approved. It will go to approvals for the different stakeholders. But that to go or no go for the release, sign off, production. Uh, then they deploy the final artifact using pipeline. If if all the other checks are cleared, and the that pack, the final package will go to production. Uh, once everything is, I mean using pipeline itself again uh, so that way we have uh, i can i can explain about this cacd process okay 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 uh this should be fine so your folks are using terraform that's what you told right <clears throat> yeah okay um why should i use terraform and not uh ansible for everything i think uh, Ansible does does support uh, AWS creation of AWS resources. AWS uh, it has plugins. I I think we can reuse that. But the advantage of uh, uh, I mean both are different meant for different purposes. One is infrastructure as code. This is for Terraform and one for configuration by automation. So Ansible is best even though it supports creating uh, resources. From, uh, from uh, using the cloud provider, but it supports. Uh, I think it is more. Uh, I think what I would say is, uh, it is more stable for configuration than creating infrastructure. And the advantage of this Terraform is basically it's a cloud agnostic. One thing, uh, of course, I mean it's just a basically based on the provider. It uh, we can deploy. Of course, we need to change resources and all. But uh, with the same same. All into the same configuration. We can deploy across the different environments uh, with uh, with the different. I mean, Azure, or if we have any multiple or uh, multi cloud environment requirement. 
Okay. Uh, what are the branching strategies that you guys follow? Uh, we have uh, different, like each project can have different branch strategy based on the team size and based on the based on the maturity model that the development team. Uh, so I have I have familiar with the feature branching, which is trunk based model, and one is release based model, uh, and Git flow as well. So let's say um, tomorrow, if there is a bug in production, how yeah. will uh, the what would be the flow for your branching strategies? Okay, so uh, one thing is here is if the bug is in product. Okay, okay. Uh, there are two things here. One is uh, once I deploy, the the users found or some immediately we found a bug. Then we have a possibility to roll back to the previous version. So we can run uh, previous. Uh, I mean, uh, in in Bitbucket there is a possibility to roll back to the previous thing that we can do. Sorry, sorry, bamboo, uh, and in Jenkins also we can we can build a pipeline to to roll back to the previous version. So okay. if it is okay, I would like to cut you right there. Okay, there is no option for rollback. Uh, I'll tell you a scenario. Okay, mm -hmm. so let's say uh, there were hundred features that we were delivering. Okay, okay, four features has bug. Now mm -hmm. these ninety six are really critical, and everyone is everyone has already started using it. Because mm -hmm. we have made a promise that on this date we would be delivering hundred features. Yeah. Now ninety six features are going fine. Would you go for rollback for those four features not working properly? Definitely no. Uh, then how would you do a, it? Okay, there is a concept called feature flags. Mm -hmm. So if we can have that implementation, uh, just one second. Huh? Sure, sure, no problem. Uh, if if okay, I think if with the feature flags mechanism, uh, that is been more effective to control the each feature can can go into production or not. Even if it's production, I just switch off the feature flag that will be off from the production environment. So the feature flag is one of the branching strategy that recently. I mean, it's been it's been there quite long, but now people are started using. If it is a kind of uh, these kind of scenarios, we can go ahead. But I I know the problem with feature flags also. It becomes quite messy. If, more uh, if there are any uh, if there are more if I mean if the code becomes more of if loops or conditional checks if it if it is more of uh, uh, you know if we used to started using more more feature flags but yeah for that scenario I recommend using feature flag kind of thing but yeah ideally I mean this is one example that I understand you quoted but uh, usually that we will not deploy that much bulk changes into the production we deploy a, a quantifiable change. And at least quite frequently. Okay, but uh, like, how will you send the fix to production now? Okay, so yeah, I think what I can do here is I think fixing issue in production is one thing uh, that is maybe it's like a hot fix that I uh, I, I build. Uh, well, after let's say I I am using feature flags, I switch up the feature flag. And uh, the code will not go into production. The user will not see the change. And I, 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 I as a as a developer, I ask, uh, I as a DevOps engineer, I tell, okay, you create a hotfix branch from the main branch, uh, and then you test it and you push to main again. So that trigger will happen and it will deploy the new version. So we use hotfix, hotfix in that case. So like we we bump up that. Yeah. So you will cut cut it down from main and then fix it, push it into main, and then push the code to production, right? Yes. What happens to the dev branch, stage branch, QA branch? They they definitely need to rebase uh, from the master again. Again, like if we, they they will be. Uh, it depends on uh, how many long living branches that we are maintaining. Sometimes we don't encourage to maintain different uh, many long living branches, let's say QA for each environment specific. So I would have only master is long living branch that will be maintained. Develop, it's optional. We, we can maintain it yeah, if we have an integration branch or required requirement. Otherwise, what will happen is in our case, only master is a long living branch. Uh, so at any point of time, maybe by the time production fix, there may be a release branch, which is already happening in the development. So that they need to rebase it with the master. Okay. Okay. Cool. Let's circle back to Terraform. Uh, yeah. So 
how, what are all the services that you have created using Terraform? So uh, I created uh, what are the, the services what uh, I have info I raised like EKS and uh, uh, ECR S3 uh, Auto Scaling Group uh, uh, and RDS and IAM also we use Terraform uh, especially for bucket policies and you, usually yeah you, you uh, all the roles and all uh, in EC2 uh, by default and security groups yep yeah, all all the all the services yeah. Okay, so how are you, how are you how are you folks maintaining uh, this state file? Uh, we use S three uh, S three bucket for state file maintenance. Okay, can you tell me this setup from scratch? Like, okay. if I if you are starting a new project, how will yeah. you do it? Okay, uh, even if I go with Terraform, uh, I just need let's say there are two ways of maintaining state. One is local remote state. Mm -hmm. So I need to add a block where remote state, and I need to give the the, the bucket name. I think there is a chicken and egg problem. Which one has to go first? Mm -hmm. So you can use, a, a, I think, uh, uh, I think, yeah, if we can provide that remote block, the Terraform itself will create uh, the S3 bucket in, in uh, S3 bucket and it will store the state files according to the naming conventions that we have used. But to run a Terraform init, uh, we need to run Terraform init first. When you are running it, uh, it will instruct the S3 which is remote uh, remote state management uh, holder, uh, but we need to add uh, before running Terraform init. We need to give uh, our AWS ID and secret key. We need to either pass it to CLI or we need to store the head not AWS, the configuration. Then when you run it, then yeah, it will create a S3 bucket. Then from going forward, like we can we can uh, we we use block right. So then it will, uh, we can uh, I mean. Uh, it will be consuming same bucket to go to create the state management. But in our case, what we are doing is we are using a, a wrapper called Terra Grant. Mm -hmm. So if, I think with that, it's a, it's pretty much clear, like configurable, one time configurable in Diagram.hcl. Of course, here also we need to do the remote uh, state and all. But there, what we are doing is uh, the bucket name will vary based on the folder that or uh, the resource that I create in, into my cluster in, in, uh, inside the Terraform folder structure. So we have a folder structure like uh, the, the account, and then the customer, then the environment, and the region as well. And inside that, we can create uh, EKS, or EC2, or based on projects, I can create multiple folder structure. So the bucket name will be, it will follow the same folders like uh, account name and customer and uh, region and the AU or production, whatever, the project name, then the DF dot state. So this way we we uh, streamline the folder uh, naming convention for Terraform state creation. Uh, we already had uh, Terraform. Why do we need TerraGrant? <laughs> yeah, Terraform, actually, while I'm working on this, I see a uh, lot of issues. Issues means it works fine, uh, especially if you have a simple requirement and uh, 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 for example, for example, uh, if I if I talk about uh, example like uh, I, I, I create a S3 or EC2 instance, right? And for that, I need a VPC to be created already, and uh, uh, and some other project needs another 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 requirement. They want to create some other EC2 instance. For that, also is required. So if I go for Terraform, the duplication of modules is uh, is. Uh, I think we cannot transfer the state with Terragrant, right? It's quite easy to just add as a dependency of VPC in all any EC2 that is creating and go to that VPC folder and get the state and uh, use that uh, the variables from the dependency dependency block. So Terragrant is kind of a wrapper, uh, even though we can achieve the same thing with Terraform, but uh, uh, but the the code duplication will be more with Terraform. Uh, you need to maintain again df dot wars for and all but uh, with Terran, you don't need to maintain it it's just a one-time configuration and you just start creating the resources support, uh, as, as flexible as possible okay so what do you understand by a null resource and a tainted resource uh, I have read it but I don't recall exactly but null resource is basically uh, it doesn't create any cloud resource I think it's just a uh, it, yeah, I think it, it doesn't create any, any resource in the target environment, 
but I, from the definition point of view i think i have not i'm not uh, content with that okay 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 no problem uh, consider a scenario uh, in which you have created uh, 10 resources yeah. okay and everything is going fine now there is a new devops that has joined you and he doesn't understand and he makes a mixed mistake now the mistake okay. is that you are dynamically providing uh, sorry not dynamically you are providing the variables value from some script mm -hmm. some from some variable group or something okay you forgot to give two values out of 10 eight are perfectly all right two you forgot to provide from a variable group now when you run the pipeline it will ask you for the value at runtime yes. right yes yes but you cannot provide it because you are running from ci cd yeah how do you tackle the situation okay Okay, uh, it's like variable, how many number of ways that I can pass the variables, one is to CLI and another one is to variables.tf and another one is to .tf ads. There are multiple ways to do that, ways. but I'm yeah. just saying that uh, you, the new de uh, DevOps forgot to give it uh, the two values. Now it is asking at the runtime, but you cannot do anything because CACD has already been triggered. There is no console over there. Mm -hmm. How will you tackle the situation? Or what would be your uh, next step? I think my next step would be to, I mean, by since it is blocking or uh, since it is uh, stopping the execution, probably I will, I mean, say it's, uh, it's blocking my execution, so I'll definitely stop the pipeline mm -hmm. and pipeline and Maybe I'll work on it, but I'm not sure is there any best method to tackle that scenario. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. So let's say you have cancelled it. Okay. Yeah. That's that's yeah. the best thing to do because otherwise it will time out on it on its own. Yeah. yeah. You have cancelled it. Now the new DevOps has fixed it and he has provided those two values and everything is fine. You mm -hmm. ran it again. Would it run? Yeah. Uh, yes, if the variables are fixed, yes, it will run, yes. But you cancelled the previous build, right? Do you know the concept of state file locking? Uh, okay, okay. Okay, okay, yeah, oh, they, okay, I understand. Uh, well, it depends, actually, at what level it got cancelled. Uh, and if it is a clean... Uh, Sweep, I mean, if, if, if the lock has been released, then yes, it might work. Otherwise, it will ask you the lock ID to release it. So we might need to go and force, force, uh, forcefully uh, delete that lock. Uh, is that, I mean, actually, yeah. Okay, no problem. Um, so you have worked on Devo, uh, Docker as well, right? Yeah. Okay, so this would be my last topic for today. I won't keep you mm -hmm. for long. <laughs> okay, so how is Docker different from uh, standard VMs? Okay, uh, Docker is basically what, uh, yeah, just, uh, uh, Docker is basically container as a platform, uh, while virtual machines are basically a, a platform where, I mean, it's like, uh, single OS and you, you, all the resources will be shared across, uh, uh, all the resources will be shared across the processes. But Docker will be like, uh, on a virtual machine, I can create multiple Dockers with different, multiple different, different OSs. And the resources also, I can specify, I can, I can, uh, each Docker will consume a specific resource. I can assign uh, four, four GB so four GB for this Docker and four GB for this Docker. So I think I can have more control in the Docker compared to virtual machine. So yeah, I mean, to be frank, uh, to me, uh, to be clear example, Docker is a kind of compact virtual machine. It's like uh, we can put all the requests of software in that. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, Docker is running, I mean, uh, Docker is basically a one uh, a environment where uh, it has individual OS, it has individual resources, it has individual CPU. All all these are defined in a in a compatible uh, application. Okay. Uh, can you explain me the components uh, of Docker architecture? Docker is basically client server architecture. Mm -hmm. uh, so server is running uh, at the host. So. Yeah, and the client, which is CLI, basically. 
So yeah, uh, yeah. I think it is just uh, when when we do run Docker run command, it 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 communicates with. I think it's basically it translate into a JSON. I guess you translate into JSON and uh, it trigger the Docker server and yeah, based on that it will create a virtualized uh, a container. When you run a Docker run, it will create a container from the image. Uh, the container is basically a kind of block in the virtual machine, uh, a, a process in the virtual machine. Okay. Uh, so when we work on uh, Git based systems, right? We have something known as dot Git ignore. Yes. Do we have anything like that in Docker? Yes, yes. Uh, there is a Docker ignore as well uh, to ignore all these node modules, especially for example. Yeah. Uh, can you tell me the usage of it? If you can. Doc Docker ignore basically. Usually, Docker files, uh, I mean, Docker images have to be very compact. In fact, it should be very small, less size. We cannot, uh, well, building Docker files, right? We just sometimes do copy uh, host files into container. So sometimes we might copy wanted files as well, so which will bulk up the Docker image size. So, if, for example, if you take a uh, React JS uh, JavaScript applications. When you local build, it will create a node modules. But I don't need to build or copy all node modules uh, into the while building the Docker image. So instead of what I'll do, I'll add that node modules into the so that while building Docker build, that module will be ignored. The folder will be ignored. Okay. Okay. Have you worked on Docker Compose or something? Yes, Compose. Yes. Okay, 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 and uh, let me check if I have some scenario. Mm, okay, let's say you have a Docker container running. Okay, now uh, that Docker container has Jenkins installed in it. Mm -hmm. Okay, now Jenkins is running perfectly all right. Every job is running perfectly all right. For some reason, the container restarted mm -hmm. I am not able to find the jobs that I was running what went wrong yes. over here basically the volumes uh, once the docker is crashed or exited the volumes attached un unless you mount into some specific directory or create a docker volume specifically all the data will, will get lost so that was the reason why I, I can't able to see the whole jobs uh, in, the, in the, this, but to preserve or to persist, I need to mount uh, into a, an absolute path, either bind, bind volume or uh, mounted volume, I believe. Yeah, we need to mount the volume of the data and then we can run the Docker container and reinstall the Jenkins so that all the data will preserve. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, I think I'm done.